Okay. This section is going to talk about osmolality imbalances, or really and truly hyponatremia and hypernatremia is kind of put into this category in regards to Giddens. And um, it doesn't really categorize it that way in your Lewis book. So um, I think it's, it's not, I guess if you put your mind to it, you study it, you'll kind of grasp what's going on here. So, um, so with, with sodium, we can have it where it's too dilute, okay, or hyponatremic. And this is in regards to if it's too dilute, that becomes an osmolality issue. Or somebody can be hyponatremic because they are not taking in enough sodium. Okay, so that's where we get into the actual electrolyte imbalance piece of this. Or we can have where the, the sodium is too concentrated, meaning there's not enough fluid in the, in the system. So therefore we have high levels of sodium or they're taking in too much salt. Okay. And so when you think about this too dilute versus too concentrated, I want you to think about if you go to the ocean and you scoop up some ocean water, okay, and you set it there and you check the concentration of the salt, it's going to be fairly dilute if you have a full cup or full glass of, of ocean water, salt water. As, so you leave it sit there for two days, three days, and you come back and you check the concentration of the sodium, the concentration of the sodium is going to be higher because what's happened to the water? The water has evaporated. Okay, so that's how I want you to think about it in regards to the osmolality imbalances. So with this, we can have impaired cerebral function um, is usually what the clinical manifestations are going to be. Decreased level of consciousness. Patient becomes very irritable with hyponatremia, apprehensive and confused, dizzy, and they'll start to see major personality changes. Okay. Um, I have a grandfather that ended up with um, Syndrome of Inappropriate SIADH, is what it stands for, um, ended up severely hyponatremic and completely confused. He was um, to the point where they were going to put restraints on him. Um, he was in his, looked like he was, he was talking like he was farming all the time. Um, he had severe personality changes. So just remember that with low sodium, and you're looking, especially in the older population, a lot of times you will see this and it'll be kind of subtle. So you'll also see that they have nausea and dry mucous membranes, okay, and cold, clammy skin, and they might have postural hypo hypotension. And if the sodium goes below 130, then they can have seizures um, as well. So if it, we're too concentrated and we've got hypernatremia, okay, because again, the, the, we're not, we don't have enough fluid, then we can also see impaired cerebral function, decreased level of consciousness, okay, couple of the differences there when you look, you, you see apprehensions, apprehension with hyponatremia versus restlessness with hyper agitation, lethargy, and coma. So you kind of need to compare and contrast. So there's some similarities there, but some vast differences, especially with high levels of sodium, we can end up with, with the patient going having a coma. They'll be have intense thirst, okay, not typically in older adults. Remember, they have a more blunted thirst, um, thirst. You know, they don't get as thirsty. Dry, swollen tongue and sticky mucous membranes. Postural hypotension, the same thing goes. Um, weakness, muscle cramps, and again, seizures may be evident with, with a sodium level greater than 145. So with hypernatremia, and we start looking at our nursing diagnoses, okay, we can have a risk for fluid and electrolyte imbalance. And what this is related to is inadequate water intake, okay, or excess sodium intake or water loss during injury, all right? So if we're not taking in enough, we can be hypernatremic, or we're taking in too much salt, all right? Or somebody has water loss due to injury, blood loss from blood loss, things like that, we can end up with hypernatremia. Um, risk for fluid volume deficit related to the inadequate water intake, again, or that loss, risk for injury related to, let's think for a minute, confusion, lethargy, um, sensorium and seizures is where we get our risk for injury and our potential complications we're looking at is seizures and coma. So those are some of the things when we're, we're looking at nursing diagnosis. The nursing implementation for hypernatremia, again, a lot of times you're gonna see this in, in your reading, it depends on the underlying cause and the volume status. There's a disease process or something that's causing them to be hypernatremic. So um, the diluting sodium concentration with sodium-free water is something that, um, that you will see them do. 
So if you have a high sodium, then they may give free water that doesn't have sodium. So it's going to think about your salt water. They're going to add water to that concentrated salt. Okay. They may also use diuretics to promote sodium excretion. Or they, and in some cases, they may restrict dietary sodium, depending on, again, what is the cause of the hypernatremia that's occurring. We may have to initiate seizure precautions on these patients um, because, again, they're at risk. And then we're going to monitor the lab serum sodium and then also be looking at the serum osmolality in relation, to, like I told, showed you on a previous uh, slide uh, on the last one when I showed you the lab values. So now let's take a look at hyponatremia. So with hypotremia, if we skip back and we go back to our signs and symptoms slide, remember we can have impaired cerebral function. I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong side. Le decreased level of consciousness, irritability, things like that, nausea, dry mucous membrane. So kind of go back and look at these slides as you're looking at your um, nursing diagnosis and what the care of the patient is. So with hyponatremia, we can have a risk for electrolyte imbalance. Uh, imbalance. Um, due to excess sodium loss or excess water intake or retention, all right, so we lose too much sodium, or we take in too much fluid and it dilutes the sodium that's within our system. And remember, with sodium, it is an extracellular electrolyte. It doesn't hang out in the cells. It hangs out in that vascular area. Okay, so that's how we can have excess, you know, t drink too much water and have an issue, okay, where, it's, where our sodium is overly dilute. So risk for electrolyte imbalance related to excess sodium loss or excess water intake or retention, okay? Um, all, and then risk for injury related to altered sensorium and decreased level of consciousness. Remember the confusion and things that occur here. Risk for acute confusion is one due to the electrolyte imbalances and then potential complications is we can have severe neurological changes. Kind of like I told you what happened to my grandfather. He had severe neurological changes um, with his low sodium levels. The nursing implementations of hyponatremia are from fluid loss. What they're going to do is they're going to replace using an isotonic sodium solution and encourage oral intake or, and also they may also withhold electro, I'm sorry, withhold diuretics from that patient. Okay. From water excess, they're going to put the patient on a fluid restriction, like maybe a thousand milliliters a day. Okay, is what they're going to give them. They may also do loop diuretics. Okay, um, it can also be given, and then acute small amounts of three percent sodium chloride to restore the serum sodium levels. Very small amounts of this. And if you have patients that have a disorder called like diabetes insipidus, then they may use vasopressor receptor antagonists such as convivaptin or tolvavaptin. Okay, and this is used for individuals who cannot tolerate fluid restrictions. And then they have more, they have more symptoms, so you'll need an accurate urinary output. And these individuals will put out, um, you know, won't be able to concentrate uh, that their urine. They won't be able to. Um, I can't think what I was going to say. Okay, so one of the things it says in your book is that the level should not increase by more than eight to twelve milliequivalents per liter in the first twenty-four hours. So we do not want to increase those levels very, very rapidly because it can cause brain damage. And this concludes this section.